Today, my friends, I want to tell you a story all about the man, the myth, the legend, Casey Neistat. Casey wasn't always the king of logging, nor filmmaker for that matter. He was just a kid from Connecticut. Fast forward a few years, blah, blah, blah. Casey starts a daily vlog, gets married, has a baby, two babies, launches Beam, sells it to CNN, the whole nine yards. But don't worry, I'll get back into all that later. The vlog will continue, one million subscriber after two million subscribers, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, Beam gets shut down. I'm sure some of y'all know the rest, and if you don't, believe me, it's an interesting story. So, I guess without further ado, who really is Casey Neistat? I'm here, all of my dreams and aspirations are here, and the only thing in between these two is a bunch of work. Casey Owen Neistat was born on March 25th, 1981, to a Jewish family in Gales Ferry, Connecticut. He grew up with his three siblings, Dean, Jordan, and Van, and Casey was the middle child. His parents, Amy and Barry Neistat, were very, very hands-off, allowing Casey to have a wildly unsupervised childhood. As the middle child in the family, Casey always felt like he didn't have a voice and was never heard, which translated into acting out in his younger age. And that manifested in a lot of different ways, and ultimately it manifested with like, me just being bad. And then I, I, you know, I never did well in school. I, I, I didn't do well in school at all. The teachers were always angry at me. I was always in trouble. So I always, always felt like I was kind of being suppressed. Like I was never able to really share what I was thinking. Casey even went as far as to hang manage jars over train tracks so that when a train went through the neighborhood, it would splatter all over the windshield. He also burned down a tree house. So, uh, that, that, that's something. Casey attended the local public school. And although he never hated it in his own words, it wasn't great. He was always getting into trouble and constantly had anxiety over getting caught by one of his parents or teachers. Eventually, he transferred into Ledyard Public High School, six years after his brother Van had graduated. Casey's trouble persisted into high school. If anything, it got worse. Nice to have again hanging out with the bad kids and quickly got hooked on drugs and alcohol. And around this time, Casey's parents were going through a divorce, and a couple of feeling like he didn't have a voice, his antics were only escalated. He blamed his mom over the divorce, and after some arguments, Casey ran away from home. It was the Tuesday night, 9 o'clock p.m. to be exact, and at the age of 15, Casey Neistat was all on his own. He was able to stay over with some friends for a while, but eventually moved in with two older girls. One of those girls ending up becoming his girlfriend. A few months would pass, and his girlfriend got into a fight with their fellow roommates, and, uh, they needed to move. The two moved to Virginia, as Casey's older brother Van was attending college there. Now, I wanted to go to school there. I wanted to go to high school. I was in 10th grade. I was, it was my sophomore year of high school. But in order to be in high school, you have to be a resident of the state of Virginia. In order for me to be a resident, my legal guardian had to also live in the state. The only person of legal age then was my brother Van. I was 15, he was 21. The only option we had was for him to adopt me. And Van and I had to go literally in front of a judge, like, I don't know, like Judge Judy or whatever. And we had to petition, we had to plead our case. We were both wearing suits that we had bought at the Salvation Army for like $5 the day before. But I think the fact that the only reason why we were trying to do this was so I could go to school was something that she took pity on a little bit. She empathized with. I just remember her saying vividly, against my better instincts, I will grant this. And just like that, he was my legal guardian. We left the courtroom as we were supposed to do, and we went outside. Van was like lighting my cigarette. The judge walks out of her chambers or whatever, and I just remember her like looking over at us, making eye contact as I'm like, and she just looks at us and shakes her head. But that didn't last long, as three months later, Casey's girlfriend found out that she was pregnant. The two were compelled to move back to Connecticut and for a period of time, lived in a friend's basement. Because of the financial hardships that they were going through, Casey was forced to drop out of high school and get a job to support his family. He took a dishwasher position at a seafood restaurant and with that income, Casey and his girlfriend were able to move out into a small apartment. I had bills to pay. Like I had to get a job for very real reasons. And and having a job, even at age 16, precludes me, precluded me from, from being able to go to school. So it was tough, it was tough. And sitting there for, for years, like I, I lived in a trailer park and like I remember like what, what our budget was. Like I brought home $380 a week, that was my total take home after taxes. Our, our, our monthly costs broken down by the week were like 340 or 350 bucks, so our margins were like this. And, 
Like, couldn't go to McDonald's kind of margin. Couldn't go to McDonald's, couldn't afford the gas to get there, not because we couldn't afford the cheeseburgers, which we also couldn't afford. And when you live in that kind of struggle, where it's just pure necessity, like I'm scrubbing dishes and on the late nights at the restaurant where I could tell the boss is gonna be like, if somebody wants to go home early tonight, they can. I hide in the kitchen so I don't go home early because I can't afford to miss a half an hour of, of pay. You spend that time. For me, it was like 40, 50, 60 hours a week. When I had a second job in a kitchen, it was 70, 80 hours a week. You spend that time just fantasizing about what you want to do with your life. It was 1998. Casey Neistat had just turned 17 years old and was about to become a dad. Owen Neistat was born on April 14th, 1988, and Casey could have been more ecstatic. I don't know that teenagers are emotionally equipped for the magic that is having a child, but the feeling I had, it was similar to Christmas morning when I was little. It's like that feeling you have when you get exactly what you want. Casey had everything that he wanted in that moment, and he was happy. Although life was good financially, it still wasn't. But the next year, Casey did receive a raise and was able to save enough money to take his family on their very first vacation to New York City, the Big Apple. Owen was a year and a half old at the time and they stayed with Casey's brother, Van, who had recently moved into the city. Van had also recently purchased himself a brand new iMac, the very first iMac that could edit video. Hence, Casey and Van made their very first short film together, Owen visiting the zoo. Casey felt something that he always wanted and frankly needed as a child, having a voice. And I like immediately fell in love. It was the most liberating experience of my life. First time I ever played with video, all of a sudden it felt like a way of sharing my perspective. It was like a way of uh, taking my voice and turning it into something tangible, which was a video. And I fell in love immediately. The self-expression, no matter how small scale the films were at the time, was overwhelming for Casey, and he quickly became obsessed with the medium. When the family eventually returned home to Connecticut from New York City, Casey maxed out his credit card and buying himself a brand new iMac and a camcorder. Every spare moment of his free time, Casey committed to make home movies with him and Owen. His dream was to become a filmmaker and to move to New York City like his brother. Brother. A little time would pass and Owen's mom, Casey's girlfriend, dumped him. Casey had originally planned to move to New York City in five years, but now he had nothing to lose. So uh, with no job and no income, he moved to New York City. And that was really to pursue a dream, a dream that was born from, uh, again, feeling stifled and not being heard. Because what I could do was, with words was always sort of clouded by the fact that I was this loser, that I was this dropout, that I was this sort of this burden of, on society. Since he didn't have a job and hence no income, he took a three month sublease and moved in on June 4th, 2001. Neistat needed a job, but in New York City, that's a lot harder than it sounds. Casey would travel back to Connecticut three days a week to visit Owen, but while in New York City, he spent every waking moment attempting to prove himself. His worst nightmare was that his son might grow up thinking that his dad was a loser. And Casey wasn't gonna let that happen. He picked up a gig as a bike messenger and although it was, it was my Money, it didn't pay very well at all. Eventually, his three month sublease ran out, pulling him back to square one. Thankfully, one of his friends who lived in the financial district of New York City had a free sofa and offered it to Casey for a month. And Casey moved into that apartment on September 2nd, 2001. Here's some of the footage from that, uh, from that terrible day. See, this was when, these are the firemen like all rushing in. Um, this is me biking through nearby. These are all people waiting outside. That's the World Trade Center right there burning. That's, that's 20 year old Casey, scared out of his mind, riding my bike up the West Side Highway to get away from, to get away from the towers. And there they are burning. September 11th, 2001 was a dark time for us all and Casey's apartment was right next door. His new roommate left New York City and Casey was back once again fending for himself. Though he did stay with Van for a short period of time. Although many close friends and family advised Casey to move back home to Connecticut, New York City was his home and becoming a filmmaker was his dream. There was no turning back at that point. Casey needed to make this work. He continued his job as a bike messenger and hustled to find any job that involved the camera. And the reality is there were 10 years of real hardship, 10 years of real struggle living in New York City. 
10 years of, of you know, living in an apartment that was effectively filled up with undocumented immigrants and people um, that just got let out of prison. And the hustle part of that was that I never said no to anything. I never said no to anything because I could always see an opportunity no matter what it was. If it was a bar mitzvah video, then I was like, well, maybe someone will be at this bar mitzvah. That could be the key to the next door I want to walk through. If it was a wedding video, I was like, well, maybe the bride's dad will be that guy. Maybe the bride's mom is an executive at a media company. Like every, every, everything that came my way through it involved a camera, I saw it as an opportunity. Like I, I said, I never said no to anything. I did everything. I worked for free. I would always pick up a camera for free. If someone said, hey, do you think you could do that? I'd be like, yes. Like, are you kidding me? Like, you stranger want to validate me by letting me come to you with a camera? Everything was an opportunity. I said no to nothing. And I think it was just that, that that yielded the success, the initial success that I had. One day though on his bike route, Casey Neistat was introduced to Tom Sachs, an accomplished artist. Tom made sculptures out of construction barriers and had a bid up for $10 a piece for people gutsy enough to illegally steal them. Because obviously you can't just take them without breaking the law. If you're willing to take that chance, he would reward you. <laughs> um, so I went around and I got like 12 of those things and I stacked them up on like a like a like a cart that I found in the street. And I'm like pushing, you can't bring it on the subway. I'm like this like 20 year old kid like pushing him down 6th Avenue in New York City in the middle of the day. Cop stopped me and he like pulls up next to me and he's like, hey man, what are you doing? And I was like, I gotta move these. Gotta move them down to Chinatown. Not a lie by the way. <laughs> and I remember pushing into a studio and him being like, one, two, three, five, six, seven. How'd you get these? And I was like, eh. He just looked at me and he was like, you want a job? And I was like, yes, I do. And he hired me. He gave me like 10 bucks an hour. And then what I did, and I did this with my big brother, Van. I credit my brother, Van, so much for this because he was always, he always led in these things. But after hours, like nobody would be in this factory. It wasn't the artist's studio. It's just this like dirty space he rented. We'd make videos of this guy's art sculptures. And then one day he busted us. And he was like, what are you doing? And he'd be like, show me. Let me see what you're doing. And we showed him the videos. And he watched the videos and he's like, I don't want you doing anything else in here now but making videos. And we're like, okay, deal, <laughs> cool. And one of Tom Sachs' collectors was very, very impressed with Casey and Van's videos. And when stopping by, asked if they'd be willing to do a video for his husband's 50th birthday party. The duo spent days upon days trying to figure out what their rate should be, but eventually settled on $5,000. And their client quickly said yes. If they say yes, you did not ask for enough money. And then, my friends, is when Casey and Van officially became the Neistat brothers. The Neistat brothers were on a stride and continued to take every opportunity that was handed to them. Even going as far as to interviewing President Bill Clinton. But in 2003, when the brothers released iPod's Dirty Secret, things started to get real. Apple doesn't offer a, a new battery for the iPod? No. The film focused on Apple's poor battery replacement policy, and the video resonated with consumers all around the nation. The video reached over 6 million views in the first day of its release, and this was at a time before YouTube even existed. Those numbers seemed almost unobtainable during that period of time, and the Nice Time Brothers properly went viral, breaking into mainstream media. And the short film spotted the attention of television producer Tom Scott, who offered to fund the brothers on a bigger, more ambitious project. The Nice Time Brothers quickly accepted the offer and made eight personal documentary shorts, storytelling six weeks of their unconventional life. Meanwhile, though, in Casey's personal life, he was falling in love. One month after their first date, Casey Neistat and Candace Poole were married. And although it literally was the perfect wedding, being in bathing suits and all, the two had an annulment a month later. Casey and Candace's relationship was definitely rocky, to say the least. The two constantly breaking up and getting back together. Though things were looking up for Casey and his professional life. The Nice Step Brothers, Casey and Van's eight episode series, had just been purchased by HBO for roughly two million dollars. HBO then sat on the series for another two years, but eventually launched the show in 2010. The series received high ratings, but never reached a large demographic on HBO. Even still, this was a major, major achievement for Casey and the Nice Step Brothers. The two won multiple awards for their films, and they were on cloud nine. But my friends, all good things must come to an end, and that's when the Nice Step Brothers went their separate ways to pursue different projects. And Casey also really wanted to try something new and different, and something that would allow him to reach any demographic that he wanted, something that HBO 
couldn't offer. And that, my friends, took the form of YouTube. Casey launched his channel in February of 2010 and quickly began to upload videos emulating the same style of the Nice Step Brothers TV series. Over time, his style continued to evolve, merging his filmmaking chops with the YouTube format. Growth was slow, yet steady, but after releasing Bike Lanes, a short film about NYC's horrible bike lanes, Casey Neistat was definitely making a name for himself. I'm getting a ticket for riding my bike not in the bike lane. Now, this obviously resonates with people because it has become an internet sensation. It's gotten more than 3 million views online. And joining us now for more from our New York studio is the very filmmaker, the very victim of that ticket, Casey Neistat. Thank you so much for being with us. The New York Times described Casey as the bike lane vigilante and mainstream media quickly jumped on the story. At this point, Casey and Candace were split up. And this time, Casey wanted her back for good. So he replaced her air conditioner, which we all know is the direct path to a woman's heart. The channel was quickly growing speed, and Casey was no longer just a one-hit wonder. His videos were receiving worldwide media attention and began to work with major brands like Nike, J. Crew, and Mercedes-Benz, even lending himself a video essay series with the New York Times. Casey continued to post as many films to his channel as possible, reaching a few hundred thousand subscribers. And then a year later, in 2013, Casey Neistat proposed to Candace Poole, and on December 30th of that same year, he took her hand in marriage. And on December 6, 2014, Francine Neistat was born. As Casey's audience began to grow on YouTube, so did the amount of requests for a daily vlog. At that time on YouTube, vlogging was still a relatively new niche, featuring only very raw, unedited content. Far, far different from what we see today. People saw Casey's storytelling ability and knew that if he married it with the vlogging format, gold would have been struck. But Neistat declined, funneling his audience to Snapchat for vlogs. I've had a lot of people ask me to do a daily vlog. I haven't done it yet because, well, it just seems daunting, and I'd hate to feel obliged to make my life seem more interesting than it actually is. Though the audience wasn't fulfilled, and neither was Casey. So he began to ponder that daily vlogging idea for himself. And then on his 34th birthday, Casey Neistat started what we now know as the daily vlog. Yes, I'm starting a proper daily vlog. I'm psyched. So this is the first vlog entry, uh, but let me start this morning back in New York City. The vlog was uploaded on the 26th of March 2015, and from that point on, Casey had an upward trajectory. Meanwhile, Casey was also launching a startup, Beam, with his new co-founder, Matt Hackett. Beam was a social media app just like Snapchat or Instagram that allowed users to produce high-quality, raw, uncut, eight-second video clips documenting their life. Instead of scrutinizing every one of your uploads, you would just beam it. The app was released for beta on iOS on July 17th, 2015, and one year later, May of 2016, Beam was released 1.0 on Android. Okay, it's 3.27 in the morning on, what's the date today? We are about to send Beam live on the App Store globally right. Okay, available July 17th. All right, click it. It's is live. it live? It's live. Well, that's scary. We are officially live in the App Store. How'd that feel, Matt? Feels pretty good. Real life is here, social media is here, and we're up here. This is Beam. All other social apps, when you want to share a picture or video, you go like this. And instead of seeing the world with your eyes, you're seeing it through your phone. With Beam, we wanted to do something different. We wanted you to be able to maintain eye contact. There's no staring at the phone. You'll find that we have nothing but the best and most positive ambitions for this platform. If you look into who I am, if you look into who my team is, you'll see that we're a collection of individuals trying to do something really positive. Trying to remove the self-awareness and the self-consciousness from sharing on social media. Casey had vlogged the growth of the startup on his channel and it was his baby. Although the app was heavily, heavily marketed and even had the face of the great Casey Neistat running the platform, Beam never really caught on. The daily vlog continued as usual and very quickly Casey Neistat reached his very first million subscribers. I just passed one million subscribers. <laughs> Thank you.
reaching 2.5 million by his one year daily vlogging anniversary. Casey was riding the wave of his daily vlogs, and uh, rightly so. During the stage, he was publishing his most viewed content of all time, like when he reviewed a $21,000 first class airplane seat and snowboarded with the NYPD. He even won GQ's new media star, Man of the Year Award, and had a cameo in Nerve. But Casey got himself into a little bit of controversy in 2016 when he announced his support for presidential candidate Hillary Clinton. I avoid talking politics on this channel, on this forum, because politics are divisive. There's always two sides, Republicans and Democrats. There's left and there's right. I can have my opinion and there will always be an opposing one. That is the nature of a healthy democracy. But this is not that. This is about a megalomaniac who's driven by nothing but ego. A man who cares exactly zero about the people of this country. A person who brags about sexually assaulting women and shames others for the way they look. We have the power to ensure that this tax avoiding, lying, racist, misogynist stays away from power and out of the White House. All right, I'll see you tomorrow for a fun, happy video. Thank you for your understanding, and thanks for the time. The video, though having some valid arguments, was not received well at all on multiple levels. The country was, and frankly still is, divided, and the way that Casey presented his arguments made you feel evil if you supported the other guy, which alienated half of his audience. That being said, people were quick to warm back up to the nice step because we just all wanted to get back to daily vlogs without politics. Even still, a few weeks later, Casey Neistat decided to end the daily vlog in November of 2016. It's not clickbait. I really am ending the vlog. It's just this, the last, whatever, 18 months, 500, 600 videos, this experiment, it's over. I was genuinely bored. I was exhausted and creatively depleted when it came to making that vlog. And I felt that way for the last several months. And the reason why I kept going is because I wasn't entirely sure what to do next. As unfortunate as it was for the fans, it allowed one of our favorite creators to focus on making better videos and become more fulfilled in his craft. Meanwhile, over at Beam, things weren't going so great. People were already on Snapchat, and amidst all of its potential, Beam was falling apart. Sure, yeah. What's so burn right now. How much money do you have in the bank? We have we have 11 full-time employees at Beam right now, and 10 of them are technical, and one of them is Jack, who runs our social our social team, and our burn with that is just under $200,000 a month right now. You know, we're at a place right now where we have to figure out what the future looks like. And Meanwhile, CNN was interested in diversifying their media news outlets and one of the talents over at Beam. Hence, CNN offered to buy Beam and all of its employees for an estimated $25 million, becoming a subsidiary of Turner Broadcasting System Inc. And with CNN and my team at Beam and my partner Matt Hackett, we're going to be starting a new like media and technology company. It's a very big deal. It's a very big announcement. The Beam team now has sufficient funds and backing for their projects, allowing them to expand their horizons. Beam's mobile app did eventually die off completely, but the team allocated most of their resources to online content, like Beam News, for instance. But then, all at once, out of nowhere, Beam was shut down. I've re-recorded this video like 10 times. Um, this is, finding the words here is, is, is challenging, but um, I'm just gonna make this short and sweet and to the point, which is that um, Matt Hackett, my business partner and co-founder uh, in Beam, a company that the two of us founded a little over three years ago, he and I are moving on from Beam. Beam, the company which was acquired by CNN about 13 months ago now, Beam is going to be absorbed into CNN. Um, the, the media side of Beam is going to be brought into CNN Digital Studios, where they're going to continue their work there. The tech side is going to be brought into CNN as well and they're gonna continue development on the, the two products that they've been working so hard on for the last year. I'll say that I feel like I'm taking an L here. Uh, I, I, I don't see this as a failure. I see this as a company where we succeeded. This is a company where we tried 200 times and 99 of those times we succeeded and 101 of those times we didn't. And that's, where, that's what got us to where we are right now and that's what it means to be an entrepreneur. You try things like, you know, we. I, I, Last year I stepped up to bat with CNN and I struck out. Um, but the year before that I stepped up to bat and I, I hit it out of the park. And, and that's what it means. Uh, 
If I was timid, if I couldn't handle something like this, if I didn't think this might be an outcome, I wouldn't have tried it in the first place. You know, that that's how this works. In fact, that's one thing that I feel weird about, it's just how cliche this is. Working with everybody at, at Beam and everybody at CNN has been one of the, like, the great pleasures of my career. And, you know, I wish, I wish everybody the best in moving forward. I also want to, you know, thank you, the audience. You guys have been with me since the very, very beginning of Beam. I remember when I announced on this channel the name of Beam and what it was uh, back in 2015. So this is the end of a chapter for me. And uh, I don't know, I'm, 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 a little, uh, I'm a little sad about it. But all right, I'm more to come on that. Thank you. The beam that Casey and Matt once knew and built from scratch was gone, and there was nothing that they could do. And on January 31st, 2018, the beam was officially removed and discontinued from the App Store. Casey, now without a business venture outside of the vlog, needed something new, exciting, and different. Finding this new, exciting, and different thing to work on was definitely hard, and it was a dark time. Though a few months would pass and straight from the beam offices, 368 was born. This has been the longest break I've ever taken from YouTube. And if there's one thing I've learned about myself, it's that my happiness is inseparably attached to my productivity. Casey Cook! I needed a hard reset. I needed a, a, a break. See, when you're sitting so close to something, it makes it hard to see the big picture. Hard to see the totality of, of where you are, where you want to be, and the best path to get you there. So the idea was this. In New York City, I would find a gigantic space. A space that I could turn into a, a, a factory or a gigantic studio. A space that was huge. A space that invited collaboration. A space that I could invite all of my friends to come work and, and make videos and do stuff in with me. That would be the very core of the narrative of my new daily show. My life is now building this new thing, this new entity. You call it a company, but I'm not sure what the business is behind it yet. You might recognize this space. Does it look familiar? There's no f***ing way I was going to take an L on this space. This is mine now. And the 368 vlog followed soon after with fellow creator Dan Mace by his side. Casey's channel will continue to grow in numbers and pretty soon reach and surpass 10 million subscribers. Mid 2018, he began to dabble in the world of interviews when he interviewed the CBO of YouTube, Robert Kinsel, and creators like Logan Paul. Casey and Dan kept with the vlogs for a while, but pretty quickly 368 took a shape of his own. Creators from around the globe were setting up speaking engagements and having conventions over at 368. Nice Dance dream was fully realized. But because of this though, the vlog ended once again. He did the YouTube Shawn Mendes documentary and freed himself to work on bigger projects. Him and Candace even launching a podcast, Couples Therapy, straight from the Beam offices. And on October 12th, 2018, Nice announced that Candace had given birth to a baby girl. I want you to meet someone. This is Georgie. Georgie Neistat. 2018 was an amazing year for Casey Neistat, and even though it started rough, it truly became something special for the entire YouTube community. May of 2019 would roll around, and Casey announced that he'd be moving from NYC to LA, the city of angels. This move was definitely a surprise to many, many, pretty much everyone on the YouTube community, as New York City was his home for almost two decades, and if you've seen any of his videos, it's clear Casey loves that city. Studio Redux, Casey Neistat's brand new LA-based set was announced in August of this year, but not much else has been shared. Currently, Casey is taking a step back from YouTube to work on multiple feature-length documentaries and is happy with not uploading daily. You know, I have to say that I, I drew a lot of confidence from creators who go away and then come back with a big video, who go away and come, and sure. Shane Dawson does it amazingly, and mm -hmm. you know that when he's not posting, he's focused on what's next. But even creators like iDubs, you know, like iDubs, yeah, when he comes he back, great. no matter what the videos are that he comes back with, he his audience finds it and they're there. And I think that there's, I had to find that sort of within myself, like to know that. I want to take some time to focus on something bigger and more ambitious. My audience will be upset in the short term, but they will understand in the long term 
And that was a very difficult pill to swallow. Casey Knight said has always been a different kind of creator on YouTube. He was someone that we all looked up to, admired, and even copied in some regards. But for most of his life, he wasn't a YouTuber, and his title had developed long before he pressed that upload button. For being known as a daily vlogger, his family life has stayed very, very private, and I love that about Casey. Casey and I said has done a ton of seriously amazing things in his career, and I'm so excited to see where he takes us next. As a longtime fan, and as someone who actually used to copy your video structure, I'm sorry, Casey, <laughs> I wanted to say thank you. When I was a kid, all I wanted to be was a YouTuber. I mean, you could ask anybody, I've been making videos since I was four. And after my stroke, my mental health was ruined, destroyed, deteriorated, and I know it sounds really cheesy, but every day I was able to, to watch a Casey Neistat vlog. And I was able to have hope in the future that one day I might be able to make videos like Casey Neistat. Again, it, it sounds cheesy and stupid, but it's true. I, I watched so many Casey Neistat videos during that point. Thank you so much for staying true to yourself and following your gut regarding your content. You gave me and so, so many others hope. So I just wanted to say, Thank you. There is hope in every situation, all this pain I'm facing. For every dream I'm chasing, there's hope. Whoa, oh, 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 oh. There is hope my in every hope, situation, my all this pain I'm facing. Yeah, my